Mr. Johnson, and today we'll be talking about ideas that shaped Darwin's thinking. Uh, and right here is a picture of uh, some rocks that are in Arches National Park, which is just outside of Moab, Utah. And I put this picture up here just so we can get a, you know, just an idea of um, how rocks are actually formed. And uh, some different geologists during the time of Darwin were looking at rocks um, and wondering, you know, how they formed, how old they really were. And naturalists, like Darwin himself, were wondering how these organisms uh, actually interact with the geology around them. Uh, so to begin with, we'll talk about uh, these two uh, geologists here, Hutton, which is, uh, or who is shown right here, and Lyell down here. Uh, they both concluded that the Earth is extremely old. Uh, they also concluded that the processes that changed Earth in the past are actually occurring in the present as well. Uh, so here uh, we have a picture of the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon uh, has been carved out, you know, through thousands if not millions of years by uh, the Colorado River. And you can see that the, you know, within the canyon that there's different layers of rocks and that these rocks have been eroded over time. Right? And so both Hutton and Lyell concluded that Earth is extremely old um, because during this time, you know, previous thought was that uh, Earth was just a few thousand years old, which we now know is uh, incorrect. All right, so a little bit closer look at uh, Hutton and the geological change. Uh, Hutton found a connection between the geological process all right, and geological features. And so an example for this would be um, like how mountains formed. All right? And if you know anything, or if you took earth science last year, uh, you may remember uh, where we have uh, convergent plate boundaries. And this is when two plates on earth's surface are moving towards one another. And if these two plates move towards one another, then what they can do is, uh, you know, converge upon one another and actually ripple up and form, say, like a mountain range. And um, Hutton also, uh, you know, noted that forces between Earth's surface can push up on these rock layers, right? And so this was the example here of the mountain. Um, but also remember that, uh, you know, over time, that these mountains can erode, right? So whether that's, uh, I guess, rain or snow or ice or wind, you know, can cause these mountains to eventually, you know, crumble and fall down, you know, and then maybe they, you know, over time would start looking a little bit more rounded uh, and not as, you know, uh, high up and pointy. Uh, and like I said before, he also concluded that Earth's Earth must be older than a few thousand years. And so here's actually a picture or a diagram up here that he uh, drew when he was looking at this actual cliff face. And he noted that, you know, there can be different layers of Earth. Uh, they can be laid down, you know, uh, through sedimentary ways or forces. Uh, he also noted that they could be, um, you know, pushed up or uh, I guess put down by um, by lava flows, all right? And so uh, that's what Hutton uh, concluded. Now, with Lyell and his principle of geology, um, he also concluded that Earth was extremely old and that it had to be more than a few thousand years. And his evidence was that uh, rivers carving out valleys. And so, you know, he said, well, if, if a river has carved out this valley, then, you know, how can that happen just over a few hundred years or a few thousand years? And he stated, you know, that it had to happen over thousands, if not millions of years. Um, and so while Darwin was on the Beagle, uh, he read Lyle's books 
Uh, remember that the Beagle is the ship that Darwin sailed upon. And when Darwin was actually in uh, South America, he you know, was involved in this earthquake. And this earthquake actually knocked him down to the ground. And during this time, uh, he actually noticed uh, these rock layers uh, come up out of the ocean. And uh, they say about three meters, so about 10 feet. And on these rock layers, he saw little tiny marine organisms, you know, because these used to be, you know, under the water. And so now this earthquake happened, the rock shifted upwards, and these little marine creatures, like clams and things like that, were stuck on the rock. And so, you know, he, he remembered that, and then later on in his journey, uh, high up on the mountains, the Andes in South America, he noticed that there were marine fossils that were way up on the top. And if this is the sea level down here, he was, you know, then he was like, well, maybe over a large amount of time, rock layers that were buried underneath the ocean could be pushed up. Uh, and that's what, you know, accounted for all the different fossils that were at the top there. Um, and this picture right here is just showing that, uh, that different rock layers can be different ages and that they can be pushed around by tectonic plates moving into one another, or that lava can come up, you know, from the mantle through the crust and create volcanoes. All right. Um, a French natural naturalist, oops, let me go back, uh, named Lamarck came up with uh, this evolutionary hypothesis, all right? Um, and what he suggested is that organisms could change during their lifetime by actually selectively using or not using certain body parts that they have. Um, and so, for example, uh, here we have this bird that has uh, these really long legs. And so what Lamarck... Uh, hypothesized is that during this organism's lifetime, if it started to, say, wade out into deeper water, um, that it could make its legs grow longer. Um, or let's say a bird stops using its wings during its actual lifetime, that the wings would actually grow smaller. Uh, he also noted that these organisms could pass those acquired traits, so for example, these longer legs, to their offspring. Um, and even though these were, you know, this was a good hypothesis, we now know that uh, Lamarck uh, and his hypothesis on evolution is incorrect. Um, we now know that organisms do not have this drive within them uh, to become absolutely perfect. All right. Um, another uh, person we'll talk about today is Mathis, and Mathis was an English economist, and uh, he noticed that, you know, uh, in London that there is this huge overpopulation um, problem, and that he reasoned that if a human population grew unchecked, so that means that there's no disease or no war, or anything like that, to decrease uh, a population, that there wouldn't be enough space and food for everyone. Um, and Darwin actually knew that this applied to other organisms. Uh, so for example, um, here we have a, a maple tree, and you guys may have one of these in your backyard somewhere, uh, or you've seen at least the seeds that they produce. Uh, and a lot of kids, what they like to do, of course, in the fall is when these dry and fall off the tree, you know, is collect them and throw them up into the sky and watch them come down and twirl. Uh, they're kind of like helicopters. Well, anyways, uh, you know, maple trees, uh, you know, they produce thousands of, oops, they produce thousands of these uh, seeds. And we know that they, you know, in the fall, they fall down to the ground. Um, but here's the important part, you know, does every single one of those seeds that hits the ground, does it grow up into, say, like a new maple tree? And, um, you know, Darwin knew that uh, not every single organism that has been produced, or even a seed or an egg or anything like that that's been produced, grows up into an adult. 
Uh, and then even if it does grow up in an adult, it doesn't always, um, you know, there's no reassurance that every single one is going to grow up in an adult and then reproduce. And uh, so Darwin was thinking, well, which individuals do survive? And then actually, why do each of those uh, organisms survive, reproduce? And then remember, reproducing is just passing on of uh, those organisms' uh, genes. And so what we'll finish up with today is what's called artificial selection. And with artificial selection, it's just saying that humans take uh, the actual variations that nature provided and we use them often to our benefit. Uh, so an example could be fruit trees. Right? So here's a, a, you know, a, a bowl of fruit. Um, but humans, you know, over the course of thousands of years, you know, have taken fruits, let's say, uh, we'll just talk about apples. You know, well, we can take one tree that has really large apples and breed it with another tree that has really large apples, and then all of the offspring should have, you know, large apples. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, dairy cows. Let's say we take, you know, this cow right here, you know, and she produces quite a bit of milk, uh, and then we keep breeding her over and over and over, and then eventually we get cows that, you know, produce a lot of milk. And so this is artificial selection. Uh, the, the selection is happening artificially or done by man. Uh, and then Darwin bred uh, what uh, he calls these fancy pigeons. And so, um, you know, he bred them to have all these different uh, traits. And so that concludes about some of the different, uh, you know, evidence and uh, different geologists and naturalists that contributed to Darwin's thinking.